died in the backseat of a Fuga combat airplane. This flight was a reward that I received from the Israeli army for serving as an excellent officer in Gaza Strip. While flying out of the Air Force base in the south of Israel, we got into an emergency situation. I started to smell something burning in the cockpit. It smelled like uh, rubber burning. Zev, the pilot, was nervous. He started doing the emergency checkups. As he made a U-turn, I looked through the window and all of a sudden I realized I can see the fence surrounding the Air Force base, which brought me back to my childhood. I was about 10 years old when my father got his third heart attack and my mother was left along with four little kids. It was a very tough situation to deal with. So she sent us to different boarding schools out of our little town of Akin. I was sent to one in Belsheva. Every weekend I would take the bus back home to Akin to be with my family for Shabbat. One Friday, I didn't have enough money for the bus, so I decided to do the 24 kilometers from Be'er Sheva to Ofakim by foot. I deviated from the road, trying to make a shortcut through the desert. Two hours later, I realized I got lost. And then, I saw a fence on the foreground. It was a long fence with guardian towers spread along it. After a while, I got exhausted and I fainted. When I woke up, I saw a big beam of light towards me and I saw a few soldiers running towards the fence. Back in the Fuga, I realized that it was the same place, the same fence, when I was rescued from the deadly desert. So I whispered to myself, Shema Israel. Then Zev made a successful emergency landing and I told myself, I never want to be on an airplane again. Daniel Gadal Bebait, Shomer Torah Mitzvot. הוא היה ילד טוב, ילד מצטיין בלימודים, המורים, ההורים, כולם אהבו אותו, היו לו חברים, כולם אהבו, יעריכו אותו, הוא ילד ממש שהיה לי נחת לגדל אותו. כשהיה קטן, היה אביב זיכרון וברכה מכניס אותו לחדר, יושב איתו, מלמד אותו פרשת שבוע, הפטרה. בגיל תשע הוא כבר עלה לתורה, ובעצם אבא שלו לא זכה להיות בבר מצווה שלו, והוא הכין אותו לבר מצווה ממש. ואז כשהתגייס לצה"ל, אז הוא גם, ברוך השם, היה בהצטיינות, נעשה קצין שם בצה"ל, וגם חובש הוא היה בצה"ל, והיה קצין של פרחי טיס, ולאט לאט הוא התחיל להוריד את הכיפה, לאט לאט הוא הידרדר, הוא בא ראה שהבית כבר לא מתאים לו, אנחנו התחזקנו, ברוך השם, בדת עוד יותר, היינו יותר מזרוחניקים, ונעשינו כבר חרדים לגמרי, כל המשפחה, גם בעלי, ברוך השם, גם אני, הילדים, זה לא היה מתאים לו. אז הוא ירד לחו"ל. ירד לחו"ל, וכל הזמן הייתי בקשר טלפוני איתו. גם אחותו הייתה שם בחו"ל, היא הייתה גרה שם, ארוני, עם בעלה, ותמיד הם היו בקשר. I uh, came to the States to visit them for two weeks. It was uh, too much for me uh, to see them uh, practicing the Judaism. I heard my new brother-in-law being excited about uh, finding uh, the Judaism as a right way to live. But I was keeping to myself the right to search around the world, to do my own search about the definition of life. I decided to live in Queens. A few weeks later, uh, my uh, cousin came over to live with me. Uh, we started to live our materialistic life. We didn't care about nothing, about anything, basically. Not about our Judaism, nor about our 
on identity or any set of value. We cared more about uh, the bachelor parties in New York and about the pubs and bars, about uh, visiting in museums and living our life in downtown and the village and uh, trying to basically live the moment. ואז התחיל להתקשר אליי ואומרים לי אם אני רוצה לחקור דתות, אני רוצה ללמוד את האסלאם, אני רוצה ללמוד את הנצרות. אז אמרתי, מה, מה לך ולזה? אז הוא אומר לי, את רוצה שאני אדעתי נכון? אני רוצה להוכיח לעצמי שהדת שלנו היא נכונה, לא שאני, אה, הסבא שלי העביר לי את זה, או שהאבא שלי העביר לי את זה, אני רוצה להוכיח לעצמי. אבל אמרתי, אמרתי לו, מי אתה שתוכיח לעצמך? מה אתה, אברהם אה, אה, אבינו? מה אתה, משה רבנו? מה אתה, המוראים הראשונים, האחרונים? היו גדולים מפניך. תראה, הסבא היה איש צדיק, היה רב, היה... ואבא שלך הקים בית כנסת, ברוך השם, ובעיה. איך אתה רוצה להוכיח? אתה צריך ללכת ל... לא, אני רוצה להוכיח שהדת שלנו היא נכונה, אימא, זה לא ככה. כשהוא אמר לי שהוא רוצה לחשוב על קריסטיאניות, אז אני אמרתי לו, למה אתה צריך ללכת לשם? אני לא יכול ללכת לשם קריסטיאניות, אני אהיה מהם. ואני זוכר שהוא אמר לי, תשמע, יהודה. I am a Jew. I grew up in a Jewish family. And I saw Breslev, Jewish Breslev child. He will be a Breslev. Chabad will be a Chabad. So I also grew up in a specific way. And I know that we have the truth. But maybe we have part of the truth. I believe that we have the truth. But maybe Gentiles, maybe Christians receive another part, and Muslims another part. I don't know. The first book that I bought was a book of Viktor Frankl. He wrote a book, A Man Searching for the Definition. And I started to read the book. I started to open some yoga books, some meditation books, becoming more vegetarian. I stopped smoking cigarettes that I was in love with. It was while I was studying flying in Long Island. I got six licenses of flying, including instrument flying and including commercial flying, a flight instructor. I decided to go to the temple of the Maharishi Mahash Yogi in Brooklyn and to start my spiritual journey. I bought Bhagavad Gita, which is the Bible of the Far East, and the Srimad Bhagavatam. And then that was a point for me where I decided to leave uh, the temple and the search there and maybe to make a change in my life, to move. I took all my stuff and I drove it 28 hours to Florida together with my cousin, Gabi. והיה לי איזה חלום שכל הזמן תמיד חזר על עצמו. אבא שלו היה בא לי בחלום ואומר לי, לכי תחזירי את הבן, לכי תחזירי את הבן. הייתי אומרת, מה, חלומות, חלומות שווי לדבר, ואני יודעת, מה, לא התייחסתי, אבל זה חלום שחזר כל הזמן על עצמו, כל הזמן. I got to know a few priests. They invited me to study group with them. I came over every Sunday after the prayers in the church. Uh, but not only in Cornerstone, sometimes it was uh, in some other churches. 
They invited me to their houses. They also convinced me to get baptized to Christianity. At the age of 30, I got uh, baptized in Golden Beach and I was uh, starting to intend to churches every Sunday and studying Christian theology on a regular basis. A few years after, I hear that he is already very deep, very into Christianity. When I hear the way he speaks, I say, oh no, he went very far away. He's a really Christian, he's a really believer. And he knew the Torah, he knew the Gemara, he knew so many things, so it was very difficult for me to have a debate with him because he was much, much, much prepared. Anyway, but thank God. Anyway, I do have special tools, maybe, that I can always use, even with these great Jewish and smart people. So what I did, with the help of God, I contact myself with the right people. He told me, you know, I'm your brother. I'm your brother-in-law. Let's get together. I know Christianity. I know it very well. I was raised as, and born as a Christian. And I was also giving lectures in the churches, in, in, in Veracruz, in Mexico. He told me that he is willing to come to the States and uh, and uh, he have a seminar in upstate New York in Muncie. And maybe uh, we can get together there and argue Christianity, Judaism. I was supposed to present Christianity, I was supposed to present Judaism. I promised him that I would come to visit him in, in Muncie and argue with him. I was sure that I gonna eat him for a breakfast five uh, and a half months after. I was already prepared by the group of priests that I was a friend with. I told them what I'm about to do, and uh, I told them that it's, uh, there is no choice, it's, it's part of my family. It's either now or later, but they found out, and uh, I must uh, know my way. And so they decided, basically, instead of talking during the gathering uh, theology, free theology, or giving lectures about the about Mati Marcus Lucas John, to speak theology against Judaism so we can protect the parade of the church. Then I flew five and a half months after with all my books, with the New Testament, with the NIV, and the international translation of the Bible, with the King James and all the books. We have a very special person who is a Jew, who is from Mexico, Dr. Betech, which is full of knowledge of this topic. And we prepared, he, it was on time, okay, because my brother-in-law, Daniel Azor, was a very busy person, and to take him away for a seminar or for spending one day to have a debate about Christianity and Judaism, since he feels so much sure about his way, it was not easy to do that. <laughs> Dr. Batesh was managing the argument. He told me, if Christianity is right, I'm willing to convert to Christianity. 
But if if uh, Judaism is right, we're only asking you to uh, stop your activity and to leave the church. We signed a contract about how the argument should be. And right after we agreed what should be the rules, then we started the argument and the argument went on and on and on all night long till the morning and then the rabbi is asked to go and to pray shachrit, the morning prayer. It was maybe 18 hours constantly, continuously, about the debate between Christianity and Judaism, very, very special debate. What happened was that, if we can say, of course, the truth is the truth, my brother-in-law for the first time felt that he don't have the answers for all the questions that we have for him. And anyway, he's an intellectual person, not because of that he's going to run away to decide yes or not. He has to take his time. <laughs> I flew back to Florida with a long list that I couldn't answer, but I was sure that it's me that cannot answer the questions. It took me almost a year to study back and forth, to get questions through fax from Jerusalem, from Mexico, from New York, from many other places. And the conclusion that I made that Christianity doesn't have an answer to many, many, many questions. The rabbis were very precise, very clear with their answers. And they were able to answer me clearly, shortly, and straight to the point. At that point, I realized that there is a big chance that I might be on the wrong way. למחרת אני כל הלילה לא ישנתי ועד שסוף סוף נרדמתי לקראת הבוקר ואני רואה את אבא שלו בחלום ואומר לי לכי תקומי ותחזירי את הבן אמרתי יואו זה אותו חלום שאני כל הזמן חולמת איך זה יכול להיות אז אמרתי טוב אני חייבת לעשות משהו פה אמרתי מה אני אקח לו מתנה מה אני אקח לו מתנות הכל יש לו יש לו מטוס פרטי יש לו אוטו, יש לו בית, שמעתי, מתקשט, אני אומרת לו, דני, מה אתה רוצה שאני אקח לך, שאני אביא לך במתנה? הוא אומר לי, אם אתה תביא רק שמפוני כשבע, זה אין פה. אמרתי, טוב. התחלתי לחשוב, אמרתי, אני חייבת להזכיר לו את העבר שלו. הלכתי לתשמישי קדושה, קניתי מזוודה של תשמישי קדושה, קניתי לו תפילין, טלית, סידור מאור. תהילי מאור, רשמתי לו שם את השם, ככה יפה, שמתי במזוודה ולמחרת טסנו. הגענו לניו יורק, לקחנו שם מטוס מניו יורק למיאמי, הוא חיכה לנו בשדה תעופה, למחרת הוא רצה שוב פעם להטיס את, ה... את בעלי ואת הילדים, על שמי מיאמי, פלורידה, הטיס אותנו שם, אמרתי, שמע דניאל. כפרה עליך, אני נשארת פה בבית, אני מה זה עייפה, רוצה לנוח, הטיסה, זה מעייף אותי. אתם תטוסו תהנו, אני אשאר פה בבית. מה עם הבת, עד שאת בת, אני שלוש שבועות לא לקחתי חופש, אני לא עובד, לא לומד. הנה המטוס הפרטי שלי, הרכב, הכל, בשבילכם הכל, תהני, כל הזמן אתה עובדת. אמרתי, אני נהנית שאני נחה, בסדר? אז הוא אומר לי, טוב, כרצונך. הלכו, יצאו הבנות ובעלי. לקח אותם, הטיס אותם, ואני אמרתי, אני באתי לעשות פה משימה, לא באתי לטייל. לקחתי את התהילים, התחלתי לקרוא, ואני בוכה, וקוראת, ובוכה, וקוראת את התהילים, ואני ממש, אני נזכרת בזה, אני ממש בוכה, התחלתי לבכות, לבכות. אמרתי, אבא שבשמיים, תחזיר את הבן שלי, איך שהיה, תחזיר אותו להיות דתי, תחזיר אותו לארץ הקדושה, תחזיר אותו. אני מרגישה שהילד שלי זה לא זה, מה קורה? אבא שלו בא בחלום, הוא ביקש שאני אחזיר אותו, אני לא יכולה להחזיר אותו, אתה תחזיר אותו, אבא שבא שם, אתה תעזור לי להחזיר את הבן חזרה לבית. ב-2015 
בישלתי את כל השבת, אם זה דגים, אם זה חמים, אם זה עוגות, אם זה כמו סקוזי. ערכנו שולחן, ישבו, באו הישראלים, בא הבן דוד שלו, יואו, 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 אמא יום, את מזכירה לי, את מזכירה לי, את מזכירי את הבית, את מזכירה לי, אז את, את, את שולחן של שבת. את... אז אמרתי, והדלקנו נרות שבת, בעלי קידש, הילדים שרו, אמרנו דברי תורה, הוא התחיל אה, ממש לבכות. And I started to basically not to come on the Sundays to the prayers and not to come to the gathering with the other priests and, and pastors in uh, North Miami. <laughs> הוא מסתכל על האיש במראה פנורמית, ואני רואה זולגות לי דמעות, הלב בוכה. זה משהו בפנים, נורא, נורא. הייתי בלת עם ספורט, נסעתי והגעתי ליד כנסייה קתולית, ואני אף פעם לא נכנס לכנסייה קתולית. תשע בערב, נכנסתי לכנסייה, מסתכל על הספסלי עץ המגושמים, ואני רואה את ישו שם צלוב על איזה דמות ענק שם עם כל הציורים באדום של מריה הקדשה, הכל חשוב. רק הפינת וידויים של הכומר שם הדולקת, אני אומר שם, אני אומר, ריבונו של עולם, בעברית, ממש מרגיש סערה בפנים, מרגיש, לא יודע, איזה השפלה בפנים, איזה כאב עמוק, אני לא עצמי, ריבונו של עולם, אני באמצע החיים, אני לא יודע איך להמשיך מפה, לא יודע איך להמשיך, אני קרוע, אבל אתה לא פייר, אתה לא פייר, אתה אלוהים לא פייר. זוכר, אני לא אציב. לא למדתי בולי חזק ודתות וזה ו... אבל אנשים כמוני, לפחות דבר אחד הייתי אציב. חיפשתי אותך, יש אנשים שלא מחפשים אותך. שלא אכפת להם שיש אמת. או אין אמת. הם לא קונים זה במכולת, אז זה לא מעניין אותה. אבל אני חיפשתי כל הזמן אמת, ידעתי שאי אפשר לקנות בלי אמת. אז חשבתי שפה אמת אז טעיתי. אז הלכתי לפה, אז טעיתי, לא משנה, לא יודע. איפה אתה? יש לך חזקה, אין לך חזקה, יש לך צלב על החזקה, נזיר דיבטי. איפה שתהיה אמת שם אני אהיה, אתה יודע את זה. אני נאמן לאמת, אבל דבר אחד, אני אולי לא יציב, אבל דבר אחד ברור לי, יש אמת, חייבת להיות אמת, אי אפשר לחיות בלי אמת, ריבונו של עולם, תן לי סימן! תן לי סימן! וזרקו לי דמעות מהעיניים, פשוט בכיתי, ריבונו של עולם, מי אתה? הגעתי הביתה ממש נסער, אמרתי, עזוב שטויות, אתה חושב יותר מדי, חיים קשים, מה אתה חושב? עזוב, אל תחשוב, שתתתי את הפנים, התחלתי כוס קפה. נשארו לטלוויזיה, אתם יודעים, לאמריקאים יש טלוויזיה, למוד קונטרול, 120 צ'אנלים, טק, 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 טק. אני מדליק את הטלוויזיה ואני רואה רב, בפעם הראשונה, 19 אינץ' טיווי, אני רואה רב במרכז המוסך, מצביע עם הפינגר שלו למרכז המוסך, ואומר לי, יואו, אתה היהודי שנמצא שם בליבינג רום, אתה היהודי שחושב שאלוהים לא שומע את התפילה שלך, הוא שומע תפילה של כל יהודי. היום הוא לומד בחבל דעת, הוא כבר היום רב ברוך השם בישראל, מרצה, כותב ספרים, הקים משפחה עם ורד שהיא גם באותו זמן שהוא חזר בתשובה, היא גם חזרה בתשובה בלי שהם ידעו, והקימו בית, יש להם שבעה ילדים, ברוך השם. תודה לאל, תודה לקדוש ברוך הוא שזיכה אותנו.
There is intense missionary activity in northern Israel. In the streets, malls, and even at home, you might run into a missionary who preaches to believe in Jesus. In the last month, the cult Jews for Jesus launched an unprecedented campaign in northern Israel. Two weeks ago, we saw them here in the mall, distributing flyers and stuff. People are completely unaware that they are missionaries. Because they come to you wearing kippah and tzitzit, and you're sure they are religious Jews. A few months ago, I received a copy of the New Testament. I destroyed it. Missionaries in northern Israel are on a widespread campaign to convert the Jews. The campaign began full force in the north. These short films are aired worldwide, showing how this cult brainwashes and converts people. They all have one mission, to wipe us out as a nation and to make the Jews a part of the Christian world. They have not succeeded yet, and we will make sure they will not succeed from now on. From our perspective, this is like a murder. Our guests in the studio are Dan Seret, CEO of Jews for Jesus, and the anti-missionary advocate, Rav Daniel Asor. Good evening. First of all, we are not dealing with missionaries or conversion. We are merely talking about representing our faith, okay? We are Israeli Jews, and we have come to believe that Jesus, whose real name is Yeshua, okay, is here to redeem the nation of Israel. He died because of our sins. He was resurrected on the third day, and he fulfilled the biblical prophecies, and he is the Messiah of the Jewish people. This is a Jewish message, a message of peace. But the missionaries have an agenda to promote a certain religion or faith, which is what you're doing. Okay, we are teaching our beliefs. If you want to call it missionary activity, fine. I call it democracy, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. I am a former missionary. I've been a missionary for seven years in Florida. So you're familiar with the topic? I know it well. They use all kinds of dishonest tactics. They are totally illegitimate. His idea of presenting a religion is in fact converting a religion, which is illegal in Israel. He's covering it up with nice words. According to the New Testament, one is permitted to lie. Paul too pretended to be an observant Jew in order to turn Jews to Jesus. There is a heavy missionary activity against Jews in the US and in Israel as well. They invest about $300 million a year in Israel alone just to get as many Jews as they can on their side. As a former missionary, I spent many years writing a book called At the Gates of Rome, containing all the questions and the contradictions Christianity cannot deal with. I decided to dedicate my life to go and seek those Jews, to talk to them, show them things they never thought about. I was raised in Rehovot, in a secular but traditional family. I served as a fighter in the army. After the army, I decided to leave Israel. I thought there is nothing for me here. Then I started scuba diving. I became a diving instructor, where I met my wife, a Christian diving instructor from South Africa. In the process, when I, when I was a teenager, my mother um, became a, um, a Christian, born-again Christian, and tried to pull me into into the the Christianity, but it was very it, I couldn't receive it at that time, and so I, I left home after high school at, um, when I was almost 18 and began to travel, and in the traveling I started to look into um, many many there was a seek there was a, a spiritual seek into many New Age religions into. Um, Buddhism, a few things like that. Well, uh, we continued traveling and uh, 
we got to a ranch in the mountains of Mexico. We lived there for a year with a Christian family. Uh, they introduced us to Christianity and uh, that's how we actually got into the Christian theology. And so in that process of meeting these people who were really amazing in Mexico, living on a farm, we began to read the, we read the New Testament. And, that, and it seemed at the time it was just, it, for us it just, it, it really was, um, it brought a, it brought um, a direction and because I was looking in very many different places and I felt that that was something that I could more grab. We would always read the we'd read the Old Testament, we'd read the New Testament, and there were always these discrepancies. There's things that, you know, in the beginning you say, okay, you know, maybe I just don't understand, but then afterwards you just saw that there was two different things happening here. The one, on the one hand, in the Tanakh, Hashem has chosen a nation and given this nation a, a Torah to keep forever and a nation that's set apart to him and and he says forever the Torah and then in the New Testament how it will speak that it's um, these things have um, passed away and and there's no more mitzvah. Um, I grew up in a in in a Christian home basically but it was the kind of you know uh, on the holidays, special holidays, this is when we went to a church and things like this. And then when my mother, when I was in high school, my mother became a born again Christian. And I thought she was, you know, a lunatic after that. But, um, but uh, I also started my search, you know, for um, something more in life. I wanted to be a good girl. I wasn't exactly a good girl, but I wanted to be good. So I was looking for someone to help me to be good. And, um, uh, my mom had taken me to like a meeting of uh, Christians and, and um, I met people that were doing good things and helping other people and uh, uh, feeding the poor and I really I liked that because I thought that could be my door to <laughs> become a good person. Not that I was evil but you know I just I was searching for something more than what I what I was where I, where I was. I did a job in Krabi, Intifada, Lebanon כל הזמן משהו בי המשיך לחפש, כל הזמן לא היה לי שקט, לא היה לי בשביל מה לקום בבוקר. ידעתי שאני יכול לעשות הכל טכנית, אבל תכלס בשביל מה לקום בבוקר. ואז המשיך החיפוש הרוחני. אני חושב שעברתי זן בודהיזם, יוגה, למדתי להיות מורה ליוגה, עשיתי טאי צ'י, עשיתי כל דבר שחשבתי שיוכל לקרב אותי אל הרוחני. חיפשתי להיות בן אדם טוב, רציתי לעשות רק טוב בעולם, בגלל זה הנצרות נראתה אטרקטיבית. אנחנו אמורים לאהוב את כולם, וכולם בעצם הולכים לגן עדן, לא משנה מה הם עושים. לאט לאט התחילו לצאת הסתירות, והתחיל לצאת האנטישמיות. I don't really understand the Bible, you know, any way it was written in Hebrew. And that's one of the things that started to uh, kind of eat away at me. Okay, wait a minute. I'm listening to a preacher that learned in a seminary or, you know, from other English-speaking teachers, and they're going to teach me about something that was written in Hebrew and about the Jews, that, you know, Yeshua was a Jew. And if I want to really understand about what I'm believing in, I think I need to go to the source. After a couple of years, I actually came to Israel and started to volunteer. And um, I was uh, meeting with people in the old city, uh, the two brothers that run a, a store there. And I would go every single week with questions. Okay, I read in, in the Tanakh that it's written this and this and this, but it's, it's written this and this in, in the Bible. And they would tell me the truth, but I, I wasn't exactly ready to receive it at that time. So I would say, okay, okay, and I would kind of take their words and twist it to still fit my theology. And, um, but still, you know, the, it was filed in the back of my mind. We had a lot of children when she was in Goya. We had a lot of children. We were sure that we found the truth, and we are still going to continue to live. But the Lord is the Lord, the help that He has given us, He has not stopped. Something in the soul has continued to speak when it is not that. I myself was born in the United States and uh, finished uh, university there 
majoring in philosophy. After that I traveled to the University of Edinburgh in Scotland for three years for a master's degree in philosophical theology and a minor in science. After that I took a half a year sabbatical and went to Berlin. At the time it was known as West Berlin, surrounded by communist East Germany. There I studied at the Goethe Institute, but also did an internship at the U.S. Army Chaplaincy Center as an adolescent and marriage counselor. After that half year in Berlin, I traveled to northern Germany and enrolled at the University of Hamburg, where I pursued what ended up being my first doctorate in a very esoteric field of theoretical astrophysics and ontology. Don't ask, but it was quite interesting. <laughs> But also, ever since the age of 16, back in high school, I'd also made a personal religious decision that I also wanted to become an ordained minister in my church. So I kept my academic studies separate from my church requirements, and a year after I was enrolled at the University of Hamburg, I completed those church requirements and was ordained a Methodist minister by the visiting bishop out of Frankfurt. A year after that, still at the university, I was called into a church where I was minister of a congregation for three and a half years. Nearing the end of that time period in the church, I met my wife, whose father and grandfather very pious Lutheran German pastors. My father-in-law actually married us in one of the five cathedrals of Hamburg, and Having finished writing the first rough draft of my dissertation, I went out on job interviews and amongst other places it had landed a postdoctoral teaching fellowship at Churchill College at Cambridge University in England. I guess at that juncture in my life, or in our lives, I guess without coining a phrase, you probably couldn't have gotten more glad Christian than my wife and I. So obviously looking at the figure sitting before you today, you can imagine that something strange must have happened on the way to church one morning. So, um... When we, after a couple of years, it, it, and Ronan, when he woke up that one day and started to say, it's, 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 it's anti-Semitic, I was like, there is no way, it can't be true. I mean, because my heart wasn't there, so I didn't see how it was anti-Semitic, you know, the New Testament. But then when he started saying this, תחשוב, זה ככה התעוררתי מהשינה, היהודים היהודים. ואז התחלתי עם עצמי, רגע, אם זה היה סינים, יושבים חבורת סינים, על חג הפסח אני מדבר, חג שרק סינים יכולים לחגוג אותו, ואז יש דפיקה בדלת, מגיע עוד סיני, אנחנו נכתוב, הגיע סיני? A Chinese man wouldn't say to another Chinese man, oh look, here's a Chinese man coming through the door, that's... You know, just the way that they do about the Jews, and the Jews did this, and the Jews did that, and the Jews... But it's written by a Jew. Why would the Jew talk about the Jews? Wouldn't he say, oh, you know, the, the, the rabbis did this, or the rebels did this, or the... You know, whatever. You know, they would, they would speak about the group or, or the person. They wouldn't just say the Jew. And this is when he really helped to open my eyes. And then when he said that, I basically put the book aside, because I realized, oh, no, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> So I particularly came to Germany to study theology because it was the bedrock of Protestantism and to find out, to, not to find out, but to realize with such clarity that Kristallnacht had taken place in the bedrock of Christianity and Protestant Christianity and only to ask myself the questions, where were all of my Protestant ministers and where were my Catholic priests, my theologians? on that night of Kristallnacht, when they had the opportunity to put into practice that edict of the New Testament, that if you do it to the least of these, my brethren, you do it unto me. Where were they that would have Bible study groups and prayer groups learning about the so-called Good Samaritan, when they could have opened their doors and sheltered the persecuted, feed the hungry, and given succor to those that are in dire straits? I went to university in America during the Vietnam War crisis the shootings on, camp, on Kent State University, the rioting in the streets, the protest songs of Woodstock. I went onto the streets of Edinburgh and Berlin and Hamburg, and the students in Europe equally got out on the street and protest all the good social causes. Where will my university students at the Kristallnacht? At the Rabba, to the contrary, the university students in Germany and in Austria 62% of the university students got out in the streets and got trucks and went to university libraries, school libraries, municipal libraries, 
taking off of the shelves all the Jewish books that they could lay their hands on to have large bonfires in the evenings. הניצוץ קיים תמיד, אבל מכוסה בזימה, פריצות, במאכלות אסורים, בהתנהגות שהיא לא נכונה, כי עכשיו הכל מותר לך, אין לך מצוות. אז נכון, הכל תחת אצטלה של אנחנו אמורים להיות קדושים, אבל תחת פני השטח, הכל מותר. הכל מותר, כי נסלח לנו כבר. אנחנו כבר יושבים לימין האלוהים. הגישה הזאת היא גורמת לבני אדם לשחיתות מוסרית. כי ברגע שאומרים לך שאתה טוב, אתה לא בודק את עצמך. עכשיו, נכון, אתה טוב, אבל אתה גם טועה, תבדוק. אבל אני עדיין מנסה למצוא דרכי לעשות את האדם, אתה יודע, עדיין חולי. אני הייתי קומן על זה ארמי, את הנאו טסטמנט, ומוריה הייתה... היא הייתה מבינה שזה, אוי 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 So he still made him holy. Uh, He's still good. Then you need to disarm the man. With time, uh, our interactions with religious Jews, uh, religious families, who came our way, uh, we had uh, many conversations with them, which inspired us to study Judaism, everything from its roots. That's it. At a certain stage, uh, my wife decided to officially convert. We went through the whole process. Um, and we tried to keep Shabbat in that. We started to keep mitzvot. We started to read how the rabbis would say um, you'd keep, you know, and started to light candles, started to do things like this. And in those things, suddenly finding blessing. Wow, you know, things that we never could work out before. Suddenly, practically, you see, wow, you know, and, and then starting to realize, wow, ha-ravanim b'met chachamim. They really, they really are clever. They really, God is, God really gave, um, gave knowledge of how to walk this Torah out. And so, so with time, just seeing, you know, this is, this is the right way. The rabbis know what they're talking about. The oral law is right. Um, until getting to a place, what finally made me go and do the conversion process, even though in my heart I was, I was converted, you know, um, the conversion process was that um, we were keeping Nida and I couldn't go to a mikveh. I didn't feel right going to a mikveh as a non-Jew and try posing Jewish. So, So then I realized, you know, I have to have to now make it official with the papers um, that that I'm kosher. I can go and get into a, a mikveh. My wife and I had found enough answers, even biblically, to warrant us to not only leave the Christian Church, but also to convert to Judaism. However, we didn't realize that even though we were coming down from a false mountain, we had another mountain to climb. As our conversion process altogether was approximately five years long. But eventually we were able to convert. There was a kosher based in in Frankfurt at the time. And shortly thereafter, my wife and I moved to the United States where we lived for five years. And after that five-year time period, we made Aliyah. We came to Yerushalayim. <laughs> I still tried to um, justify my faith and um, but still all of these questions and then and then when we we decided we just we can't anymore we just cannot anymore and but I still had all of these questions that I thought I'm not you know who am I to I can't I don't really understand this you know how, how can I little old me how can I find the answers to this ששם אני חושב, ברגע שקיבלנו את העובדות מסודרות, מה הן מסתירות, למה הן, מאיפה הן נולדו ואיך זה משפיע היום על הכנסייה, למה הכנסייה נראית כמו שהיא. אני חושב שהתהליך השכלי שעברנו, שם התחיל התיקון האמיתי. Then I started to understand, oh wow, I was wondering, I was wondering, okay, yes, you're supposed to be from the seed of David, okay, but when they give the, the line of uh, Joseph, he doesn't come from uh, the seed of David. And when they give the line of Mary, I mean, it, things aren't fitting. And then in the book, he, it's also, you know, compared to what is written in the, in the, in the Tanakh, okay, in Chronicles, and, and it, it doesn't fit. And these are things, you know, I never thought to actually compare it to that because then, then it would really give me my answer. But I did have questions about this. And there were so many things. Uh, Isaiah 53. 
I mean, I was so used to saying, oh, wait a minute, Isaiah 53? Oh, but it's about, of course, yeah, 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 it's about Israel, sure, sure. But no, it's about the Messiah. But then when I understood, wait, it's not supposed to be capitalized, you know, this word is not supposed to be capitalized because in English they capitalized the word so that it would be um, put as for the Messiah, you know, who was supposed to be Elohim. So, of course, it has to be capitalized. And I, it just, it, I, I felt like I could breathe because then all these little tiny questions that were kind of eating at me that I would keep pushing away, I was seeing the answers. Because the New Testament is full of lies, you cannot accept anything in it. It's, it's nothing in it. So all I can say in that time is that because my heart was turned to seeking the God of Israel and, and really finding out the truth, he, He's opened, opened the way. But I cannot, you know, there came a place where I, I couldn't understand what had happened in the years before because I definitely felt God's leading. We had miracles happening in our lives. We had things going on in our lives in those years. And, and so, so I, can just, I can just say at this point, I know Hashem Echad, yes, that's it. This is the God I worship, one God. I don't understand what, what went, what, but I know in those years my heart was turned to worship God in the best way that I, I could. So for that reason, I can just say he met me, you know, in those years and brought me through and brought me to Judaism, brought me back home. <laughs> This is the only religion that sends people to hell so quickly. Wow, yeah. If you check the Buddhists, they tell you if you'll be a bad person, you'll come back. You'll be reincarnated as a fish or whatever. They don't tell you that you go to hell for eternal suffering. Uh, Hinduism saying, you come back as a dog. You But to sense the soul for eternal hell, and if you believe it, that now your eternal hell depended on one person that he was a sinner. It's how to say, to look at him and to say, Raga, he sinned. How can he save me? He was lost. We went through hard time. Yeah. People that will actually be brave enough to deal with the truth, you're going to go through hell. Because you're going to deal with your biggest fear about going to hell. And understanding that no one can send you there beside the Almighty. The story of Krishna and the story of Jesus are identical. Both were executed by their own people. Both were crucified on the cross and the cross was holy 900 years before Christ in the Far East as a symbol. Both raised erected from the death after three days. Both spent 40 days with their 12 disciples and then ascended to heaven after 40 days. In the same story. It's a transformation of the story. Both also were uh, uh, born to a virgin on the 25th of December. So basically there is some other legend of other pagans religion that Christianity adapted and its source, it's not from the Bible. The essence of Christianity is embodied in the doctrine of the Incarnation, which believes that this fellow Jesus is God in human form. This doctrine was established at the Council of Nicaea in the year 325 because there was a, a look like there was going to be a schism, a breakup of the church into East and West which eventually took place anyway, 650 years later. But at that council, they established a doctrine which held the church together and held the East and Western philosophies together. And that was that they wanted to say that Jesus was 100% man and 100% God. Granted, that's lousy mathematics, but they say this is a mystery of the church. In Judaism, the second of the Ten Commandments specifically says, You shall have no other gods beside me. You shall have no image or likeness of me. The question is whether the New Testament is a continuation of the Old One, or rather it's a contradiction of the Old One. God is basically denying the fact that He can manifest Himself into an, any kind of an image 
And all of a sudden, in the New Testament, Jesus claimed, Whom have seen me have seen the Father. And in the book of John, in the first scripture, he claimed, he claimed that God manifests himself in a human body, a human flesh. When Jesus in John's Gospel states, He who has seen me has seen the Father, I wish I'd been there because I would have asked him, excuse me, but if I can see anything, I cannot see the Father. God specifically says there is no likeness or image. And not only that, but there is a prophecy of Jesus in the Chumash, in De Deuteronomy. It's chapter 13, verses 2 through 5. In that prophecy, God tells the Jewish people that sometime in the future, He is actually going to send a Jew who is either going to be a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and He's going to do signs and wonders, and these signs and wonders and prophecies are all going to come true. However, God said that this prophet or this dreamer of dreamers is going to change things just a little bit because God says I'm sending him to test you to see whether you're going to follow me that just took you out of Egypt and gave you the Torah because this prophet or this dreamer of dreamers is going to be a false prophet because he's going to say things and change things just ever so slightly Jesus did exactly that while Jesus was on the cross he was praying to God to 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 redeem him from the cross and if so why God the Father didn't answer him why is it that he need 12,000 angels to redeem him from the cross isn't he God that can do it on his own without them why is it that he have to pray to God isn't he die on the cross out of his own will to redeem the nations from the curse of the sin. Judaism is a tremendous uh, uh, intimidation. It's a, a major danger to Christianity because if Judaism is right, and every Christian knows this, if Judaism is right, that means they're wrong. So I took it to my pastors, my archbishops, my bishops, my superintendents to try to talk with them. The moment that they heard me speaking, they didn't want to speak anymore. I was puzzled by this only because they, when I was a so-called company man, part of the church, they obviously wanted, they were very proud of me learning great philosophy, theology at uh, British universities and European universities, but the moment that I had questions and critical questions, all of a sudden they clammed up and they didn't want to have anything to do with me. I was ostracized from the church. I even wrote letters to my pastor, my district superintendent and my bishop. All three of them ignored my letters and never responded. He also gave his disciples to eat from a flesh of a human being, to drink the blood of him. And they believe that the in the Eucharist, in the ceremony of the, the Eucharist, the wine become a blood in their mouth. They believe that actually the, a miracle take place and the bread turned to be the flesh of Jesus. So basically they are cannibals. And it's not allowed according to the law of the Old Testament. The Christianity does seem to, ha seem to have one big advantage. It only seems to have this advantage only because it appeals to our pain-pleasure principle. And that is, in Christianity, it's the easiest religion on the planet Earth. You don't really have to do anything. You just have to say yes and amen and get some water sprinkled on your head. You don't even have to show up for church if you don't want to. You can just claim that I'm a Christian. You go to your local tourist shop or jewelry store and buy yourself a little golden cross and you're in. Whereas in Judaism, it's a major commitment because it's not conversion to a religion. It's a conversion to a peoplehood to a nation whereas in Christianity you can convert to Christianity through say the Baptist Church switch over and become a Presbyterian if you want you can become an Episcopal or if you really want you can become a Catholic you can even go to the Russian Orthodox or the Greek Orthodox it's all basically Christian because why you don't have to do anything it's not an inconvenience as a matter of fact Christianity has it quite nicely they only say you only have to give two hours a week Sunday morning from 10 to 12 and then the rest of the week you're on your own. Even on Easter, the holiest day of the Christian church, 
you might get up a sunrise service once a year. You'll definitely go to church on Easter, but in the afternoon you'll stop by on the way home from church, buy yourself some things that are forbidden by the Torah that you say you believe in, meaning meat and milk or even ham, and you'll go and sit down in front of the television set and watch a football game. Paulus claimed, yes, God gave us for a blessing, the commands for a blessing, but since we are a slave of the sin in our body, therefore we study from the commands not only not how to obey God, but how to rebel Him. So therefore it's a poison, the commands of God, that God claimed that it's the light, it's the darkness. King David in the book of Psalms, in, in the longest chapter, claim how beautiful is the commands, how eternal is the commands, how treasure are the commands of God. What happens is, is that they say that they have a Messiah. The only thing is you only have to read the front pages of any newspaper around the world to see the Messiah hasn't come. Oh, they say, well, he's coming back. Where did this come from? Even in Judaism, when the Messiah comes, that's it. He doesn't come back. He doesn't need a second chance at base to hit a home run. He hits a home run the first time up at bat. Listen, I remember the rabbi said to me one great concept. He said to me, Hazal or Sayer said, to say half of the truth is worse than to lie. I said, how come? He says, listen, because if a person, when he come to you and he lie, so you're, right away you put a barrier and you can respect if he wants to talk, let him talk. But you already, you already have a barrier. But when a person comes to you and he starts to tell you the truth, but he's only going to be the half of the truth, so he confuses you, you identify yourself with him, and it will be more difficult for you to catch him when he's going to lie. Therefore, our sayers are saying, to say half of the truth is worse than to lie. And I said to, to myself, now I understand what Christianity is. The New Testament are using half of the true concept of the Bible and it's difficult for people to catch when they're going to lie to you. About 3,300 years ago, the Almighty appeared to the entire Jewish nation on Mount Sinai and gave us the Holy Torah. He chose us to be a nation of priests and a holy nation and He commanded us to keep and preserve the Torah and the mitzvot forever. Throughout history, we have suffered baseless hatred, pogroms, torture, murder. They burned us together with our holy books. They tried every means possible to make us abandon our faith. We the Jews, however, never tried to convince others to convert to Judaism. We just kept sticking to our eternal mission against all odds while continuing to pray every day, three times a day for the prosperity of all other nations. In retrospect, having gone through Christianity to find my way back home has helped me to appreciate my heritage much more. I practiced Judaism not because I was raised that way, but because I chose this way after much searching and I thank God each day for returning me back home. Every day when I go to the synagogue, I pray for the peace and prosperity of all mankind and for the unity of the entire creation on our beautiful planet. While I was in the process of deviating from the church, one of my friends in the church called me. He said, why don't you give us a lecture about the Jewish horns? That's how they call tefillin. Well, I went there on Sunday together with the talit and the tefillin. The church was crowded. I went on the stage and I put on the talit and the tefillin and I started showing them how it complies exactly according to the heart and the brain of a human body. This one is again the heart, and 
this one. They were all very amazed. You could have cut the silence with a knife. And then, an old woman raised her hand. She was the mother of the pastor of the church, a very old lady. She came all the way to the stage. She seemed to be very excited. And then, as she was next to me, she shouted to the whole church, In the name of the church, I'm asking a permission to hold the age of the talit of Daniel. I didn't know what for, but I gave her the age of my talit. She held it up high and she started saying in a loud voice, Hallelujah! And all the crowd responded, Hallelujah! And then she said that she has an important message to deliver and she asked someone to bring her the Old Testament from the back of the church. He brought her the book and then she announced, Anyone who wishes the Holy Spirit landing upon him right now, raise your hand. They all raised their hands, waving their hands, saying hallelujah. And then she started reading with tears in her eyes a prophecy from Zechariah, from Jeremiah, about the end of time, saying, In those days, ten people of other nations will grab the age of the talit of a Jew, saying, Let us go with you. We inherited a life from our forefathers. Let's go and worship the God of Israel. And then, while she was stepping down, she turned towards me, pointing her finger on me, and she yelled, Rabbi! I told her, I'm not a rabbi, I'm not a rabbi. She yelled, Rabbi, when you go to your synagogue, you may pray on me and on my son, that when the Jewish Messiah will come, he will redeem us together with the nation of Israel. Hi, my name is Yuval Ovalia. I was born in Israel 48 years ago. I spent many years in the American film business after graduating NYU film school. About 15 years ago, I decided to shift my talents into creating projects that contribute to society by bringing the real truth and light into the world. Since then, I have had the merit of producing films such as Gogu Magog, Zero Hour, and many more, which were distributed throughout the world in different languages for free at no charge. Millions of CDs were given away and millions of viewers 
watched those films on the net, leaving comments such as, this film had really changed my life. Thank you for making it. The film you just saw is one of the most important projects I've worked on so far. In the last few years, the Jewish nation is being attacked by missionaries who are trying to steal our souls to get us away of our mission. They spend millions of dollars in order to fulfill their attempt. Now this goes against everything we are and can cause great damage, not only to the Jewish nation, but to creation itself, including all other nations. There are a few Jewish organizations who try to fight missionary activity, but it's just a drop in the ocean. No one had really used the most powerful tool nowadays, the power of media, which is what I'm doing right now. Jews never had any hatred to other nations. On the contrary, we have been chased, abused, persecuted, just because we chose to stick to our roots, to fulfill our mission in life, a mission that was given to us by the Almighty Himself. We have no intention to fight nor to offend anyone. This film is simply telling the truth, even if it's uncomfortable sometimes. If you, the viewer, have any questions or comments, whether you agree with the message or not, I urge you to contact us by mail or phone, and we will definitely get back to you. If you wish to see more of my recent films, or any other material regarding Judaism and spirituality, do not hesitate and get in touch. If you wish to help us spread the word, we welcome any donations. Your contribution can save many souls, showing them the hidden road to eternity. Once completed, I wish to have this film dubbed into other languages and have it distributed for free all over the net, promoting it with Google, YouTube, Facebook, and other sources, while giving away CDs to anyone who wishes worldwide. All this costs money, but with God's help, I know I will make it. The same way I accomplished all my other projects, with God's help, and with the contribution of many good souls. With your contribution, with your support, we can save many lost souls. Your children, your grandchildren, relatives, neighbors. Please, help us spread the word of truth. God bless you, and have a great life. Say hi. בקרוב כל שופר יריע, נקדישך נריצה, נהלל כך את שמך, ונשיר בכל תפילה, ונקרא הללויה. נקדישך נריצה, נהלל בתפארה, ומזמר בכל שירה, השם אחד. נהלל כך את שמך, ונשיר בכל תפילה, ונקרא הללויה. נקדישך נריצה, נהלל בתפארה, ונזמר בכל שירה, השם אחד ושמו אחד. נקדישך נריצה Oh,